This is FD Talks, a brand new podcast series by Funeral Directors Live, where we explore ideas, insights, and solutions for serving families in a rapidly changing marketplace. Well, hello, and welcome to this edition of our FD Talks podcast. Today, we have Josh McQueen uh, with us. He's the Vice President of Marketing and Product at Directors Investment Group. And Josh, the last time you were here, uh, you guys had just won an Innovation Award. Yeah, yeah. It was super exciting. So that was a couple of years ago, so it's been a little bit of time. Well, can you tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, tell us a little bit about your background with DIG. Yeah, so I'm actually uh, in year 10 of working with Directors Investment Group. And so I started off uh, in 2013 right out of college with uh, our Leadership Development Academy. I had absolutely zero interest in working in the funeral profession, um, but really came to appreciate and value um, the, the profession as a whole and was also given opportunity. And so after that, uh, I was given the opportunity to lead Director's Choice Assignment Service which is now claim check and I did that for uh, a couple of years um, and all in the background what was going on was um, this idea at the time of Pasari and so I raised my hand and said I wanted to be a part of that uh, joined as chief of staff which uh, was as vague as it sounds um, was just kind of the uh, gopher um, meaning go for this go for that um, just did a lot of the work um, but ended up moving into director of sales uh, and have been with Pissari for the last uh, for about seven years uh, after that I moved into our role of uh, vice president of product and so in that role, um, we work directly with our development team. And the best, the easiest way I can describe it is that we put together the blueprints uh, that our developers then build off of um, for our customers. So that's uh, obviously for Pissari, but then also for uh, other applications that we use throughout Funeral Director's Life and Claim Check. Um, and then uh, in the past year, uh, I, my role expanded into overseeing our uh, a lot of our creative teams and really our marketing to funeral homes. Um, for all of our subsidiary brands, Pissari, Funeral Directors Life, and Claim Check. So your background gives you kind of an interesting perspective on, on funeral service on the whole. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, you know, it's, it's awesome. I've gotten to work with some of the uh, best funeral homes in the nation, and so I've gotten to see what it looks like to do it well. Um, but through, I mean, in my sales background, I talked with hundreds if not thousands of funeral homes um, during that time and so um, I, I think you know going into this conversation there's definitely some uh, beliefs and maybe even myths that are prevalent throughout the profession um, that uh, we wanted to bring data in and be able to talk through and say what you know what what, are, what is actually occurring in in the profession so what in your estimation then what do you think the biggest problem that's facing funeral directors today yeah, so we won't jump on this too much within the, the report itself, but I think the biggest one is uh, it's an identity crisis, and it's that we the profession espouses to be a service-based profession, yet if you look at contracts, which by the way in Pissari we have hundreds of thousands of these contracts to pull off of, you look at it and it's a merchandise-based business model. And so, and that's a generalization. The best ones are uh, um, reckoning with that and they're moving to service-based pricing and everything. Um, but a lot of uh, funeral homes are still holding on to this um, old paradigm that really started from furniture manufacturers making caskets and evolving into uh, uh, offering services, but still having that merchandise-based pricing model. What do you think is prompting all of this change in perspective? <laughs> disposition, cremation. So it used to be that you would make half your profit off of the casket because 90% of people were being buried. But uh, what's changed since then is, um, you know, we now know that over 50% of, uh, of Americans, and in Europe that's even higher, um, but 50% of Americans are now being cremated. And so when you don't have the casket to sell, you're saying, you know, a lot of funeral homes are just generally saying, how do we make money? How, how, how do you think that's making funeral directors feel these days? Uh, you know, the good ones view it as an opportunity and they're, they're excited. Um, but then there's some that, uh, and I, you know, I would classify it as the group that says, well, we've always done it this way. Uh, and there, I think there's some, uh, um, hesitancy, some caution, some, um, well, I'll let, you know, I'll let the next generation deal with that. 
Um, but then that, that same group becomes frustrated because when they look to sell their funeral home, it's not worth uh, half as much as they thought it was. How, how important is it for funeral homes to actually just kind of learn more about current trends and what families are doing and understanding their behaviors? I, I think it's massively important, um, partly because technology in general is changing the way that we interact with any and all types of businesses, including funeral homes. And so the pace of change has quickened so much. You add into that COVID and this pandemic, and that just escalated it another five, 10 years faster. And so the way we interacted with our consumers, even just five years ago, has dramatically changed and shifted. And so I think if a funeral home is not paying attention to those trends, then they can find themselves in a place where they're they're not losing their or they're not serving their customers as well, which is never a problem that you just wake up one morning and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, I'm not serving them well. It's something that you start recognizing whenever you start saying, well, we did less funerals than we did last year. We're starting to lose market share. We're starting. It's one of those slow, uh, slow problems that begins to show itself over time. But if you're not paying attention, you can look up and it's too late. So we have access to some new information now. Would you like to talk yeah. about that? Yeah. So, like I mentioned, um, it you know I got involved with Pissari real early on, but the idea behind Pissari really came from a study that was conducted by an independent group of funeral homes, some larger funeral homes, there's 18 of them. And the whole, the whole idea was to better understand who are we serving. And so in Pisari, we've used that data for years uh, to um, better understand, uh, you know, even just from our end, how can we help funeral homes better serve these families? Um, but we looked up and kind of the same deal and it was 10 years later and we're like, well, this data may not be quite as relevant anymore. Um, and then especially again, after COVID we're saying things have shifted. And so, uh, a year or two ago, we decided to, uh, renew this study. Uh, and so, um, through funeral directors life and Pisari, um, and then in conjunction with McKee Wall Work and Company, which conducted the original study, we ended up renewing it and really got a great picture of who are today's consumers. Have you seen, before we get too much into the study, I, I, I would just be curious to know, like going into our discussion today, did you, have you seen like evolution from the prior study into the new one? Are you seeing lots of carryover stuff? Or are you seeing abandonment of older? You know, yeah, I mean, just a few larger pieces. So we're definitely seeing um, where things that we thought were occurring did occur. And so um, we, you know, we thought and we recognized that there is a shift in technology preferences. Um, and it's not like you have to be an oracle to see that that was happening. Um, but we now have data to prove that that did occur. Um, but within that, what we're also seeing is that where technology 10 years ago was a really um, key differentiator for certain segments, it's really not anymore. It's, it's more prevalent and found throughout all of them. And so, so we are seeing sh some shifts in that regard. Um, and in some ways, they're more subtle than others. Um, but yeah, there's some real, real interesting things that we identified within this. Well, let's talk a little bit about how the study was conducted. I think that's always an important, you know, yeah. if you, if you have, if you have a study being done by a scientist who, and, yeah. and they have interest in something yeah. versus, yeah, talk, talk about that a little so bit. So it was real important to us that this study would, would be statistically significant. Um, meaning that we didn't want, it wasn't just like, Hey, let's go to the mall and survey a hundred different people. Um, it was how can we make sure that we are, um, one, getting the volume of surveys that we need. And so we interviewed thousands of people, um, but we also made sure that we had a split in d a demographics. And so it's 50% um, female, 50% male. We also had a good breakdown in um, age range. We, we wanted to make sure they're geographically spread out. And so it's not all people coming from Texas or coming from New York or coming from California. It's um, geographically dispersed. And so when once we got that group, uh, we did uh, we actually paid them to participate. And so we made sure that they were able to finish the study and we asked them hundreds of questions. Um, and so in all those hundreds of questions were uh, were answered um, wholly 
So we had several open-ended questions that we then went in and calculated, but a lot of um, uh, uh, single-select, multi-choice questions um, in that nature. Uh, and the biggest thing within this is we wanted to make sure that this wasn't skewed based off of demographics. And so McKee Wall Work has a proprietary methodology called IDEALS, which stands for Interests, Desires, Emotions, Attitudes, and Lifestyle. So it's an acronym for those things. And the idea is really to get more of a psychographic breakdown of the consumer, meaning that we want to know what is motivating them um, to make uh, the, the decisions that they make rather than trying to go off of, well, you were born in this year, you're a male and you live in this area, and so we can generalize. Because that's just not true. That's not the way things work. So we got, uh, we, we go more off of a psychographic uh, assessment of this and really start getting a good idea of what's motivating different types of people, uh, in this case, in their buying behaviors toward funeral homes. Very good. Um, and so that gives you, I, I guess that gives you data points to, yeah. to kind of move forward. How important is that data and what, what does it tell us about the families? You know, it's it, Eric Layer, who's a partner at McKee Wall Work, um, I, I like the way that he put it. And he said that it's not going to give us a perfect photograph of who these people are, but it does give us um, more of like a, an impressionist painting. And so you can think of like Monet or someone like that, um, where it's not perfect, it's not meant to be um, it's crystal clear, but it gives us an idea of who it is. And so these are generalizations, and that's the thing with data like this is uh, it's ne you're never going to be able to look at an individual and say you exactly fit this description. Um, they're generalizations, and it's something that we can say from a marketing standpoint, from a service-based standpoint, from a I'm looking to build a new location, and I want to understand this neighborhood better. It gives us a general idea of who's who's there. So let's talk about what what you found out. What was your first key finding? Yeah. So the first one, um, probably the most surprising one, is at least since I've been in the profession, the narrative has been kind of a doom and gloom. Um, it's cremations coming, and no one's seeing the value in a funeral home. And this, I mean, it's chicken little, the sky is falling. And I think the the biggest surprise is that we actually, from ten years ago to today, we saw an overall increase in the perception of the value that funeral homes present. And so it's, uh, and I, I, I'm super happy that we were able to do this before COVID because what we know is that, um, and I don't have this stat ex right in front of me, but it's something like 70% uh, or uh, maybe even more of people had experienced a death uh, in the last two years. So 70% of the people that we surveyed had experienced a death in the last two years, which that tells us that they've had a lot more interactions. Um, they've attended and they've participated in a lot more funerals and have had more interactions with funeral homes and have therefore had more opportunity to see the value that a funeral home has presented to them. That, that is pretty impressive. I know that you know while some of that was going on, I, I spent a lot of time interviewing uh, funeral homes and funeral home owners and funeral directors and that, that was one of the things that they were missing. There really became a growing need for traditional funeral service. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and in that time during COVID, obviously there's a lot of burnout within the profession, a lot of funeral homes, um, a lot of funeral directors. But if there's a silver lining in any of that, is that all that work that was done, we're seeing statistically where that's starting to pay off in the perception toward the funeral home. Whereas, um, you know, it used to be that, not to take anything away from car salesmen, but, you know, it was like, this person is just trying to upsell me on a casket. <clears throat> we're seeing now where funeral directors are more and more being perceived, and we saw an overall increase in trust of the, the, uh, the specific role of funeral director. We're saying that this person is here to help me grieve. That's awesome. Um, so what else did you find? Yeah, so uh, the second big one, um, and this is one that was important for us, obviously, from a Pissari standpoint and everything else, um, and one that we talked about for years and we're saying this is coming, but we can now say it has come, is that families are generally more comfortable planning online. And so, again, it's not a the vast majority of people, it's not an 80, 90 percent, but we're seeing an uptick where we saw from 10 years ago, 25, 30 percent more people um, are 
generally more comfortable doing this. And that makes sense that, again, in a post-COVID world, post-pandemic world, where we're more comfortable uh, live streaming things, we're more comfortable um, jumping on a Zoom call, uh, I mean, just the, the whole gamut. And so people are generally more comfortable. Now, I think a fallacy that the profession has made is this idea that consumers are going to be digital only or in-person only. And I really like what Jason Whiting um, with uh, Foundation Partners Groups, uh, I heard him say in a talk, is that it's not about being digital only, it's about being digital first. And we're seeing a big shift in that. And so it's not that a family wants to interact with the business completely online, but what we are seeing is preferences to where that um, they want to start that conversation online. They want to start it in a way that is less... Uh, threatening for lack of a better term less com committed mm -hmm. um it's they want to explore they want to browse um but then once they're ready they're going to let you know that they're ready and they want to come in in person and so we've even seen this within um our, our arrangement guide product so where we provide e-commerce tools for funeral homes and they are able to uh, start the conversation online but we're finding that 70 80 percent of the people that start online end up finishing in person so you have an abandoned cart, if you will, but now a sales counselor or a funeral director is able to follow up with that family and say, Let, uh, what questions do you have? Let us help you. And so there's a big shift in that mentality. Um, so I, it's we're seeing more and more people comfortable online, but I think as a profession, we need to recognize that this is not the direct cremation. We don't ever want to talk to you. This is about giving the family options to communicate in the way they prefer. That's sort of more of that blended experience mm -hmm. that we see across all retail. Yeah, basically. absolutely. So I, I noticed here also that um, you, you make mention in there that uh, other disposition forms of disposition are something that uh, families are developing preferences for too. Yeah, so a, a surprise for us was to see this um, eco-friendly, natural um, burial, all of that uh, rise. And so... Uh, we saw cremation rise, and that was expected. Um, it actually didn't rise quite as significantly as we thought it would. It was only um, a, a, a few percentage points. But what we did see escalate um, by over 25% is this desire to be um, buried in a eco-friendly way. And so that can be natural organic reduction. That can be, um, you know, the crazy mushroom sh suits and things like that. Uh, we're seeing, we're starting to see legislation start to shift with this as well. Like Washington, not too long ago, just passed where um, uh, terramation or quote unquote human composting is now legal. Um, and so we're starting to see a shift in this. Now, what was interesting, I think what surprises a lot of funeral directors is what we actually saw as well is normally these eco-friendly options are perceived by the funeral profession to be cheaper options. And what we found is that there is a group of consumers that is actually willing to pay more for these options. Um, and so there's a shift. And again, this goes back to, you know, my comment earlier around uh, being service-based versus um, product-based, merchandise-based, is I think at the end of the day, what we're seeing is that in a similar way that it's not going to be um, digital only or in-person only and that it's blended, is that at the end of the day, a funeral home should be service-oriented. And so how a person is uh, buried or cremated or whatever the disp disposition looks like really shouldn't matter as much to the funeral home as it should be about helping that family with a proper service. And so if, the, if you have this mentality of we're going to be, you know, 90% burial and then we'll just outsource the cremations or anything like that, you may end up be missing the mark because we're seeing a shift away from burials, away from caskets, um, and obviously towards cremation but a growing interest in these eco-friendly options. So what other what other shifts are you seeing in these study? Uh, so this is a continued shift. And so and it shouldn't be a, a huge surprise for any of us, but this shift away from religion. And the reason this is important and something for us to recognize is some of this goes back to that identity crisis. And that as a funeral profession, we got really good at, um, and I may step on some toes here, but we got really good at being order takers. 
And by that, I mean that it, it used to be within our society that religion dictated funeral traditions and funeral rituals. And as our society becomes increasingly secular, those uh, traditions are not nearly uh, dictating what we do within a funeral. And so what's important within this is a lot of the grief ceremonies, a lot of the grief rituals were embedded in those traditions. But as we move away, we miss out on those things. And so and in some cases, we miss, the, the, the family misses out on having a, a service in general because they don't understand the value of that. So they're getting away completely from religious elements? Or? No, no, again, it's this not being digital only or in-person only, not being um, you know, disposition only or service only. In this case, what we're seeing is that it's not necessarily uh, secular only or re- religious only. Um, and that we're seeing a lot of culturally religious people that they may not go to church every week, they may not go to temple every week, but what they, um, but they did grow up with that background. And so where they may not want a strictly prescriptive Catholic service or Protestant service or whatever it is, they want elements of those services to be brought in. And so, and it's more from a uh, cultural, family tradition, background, all of that. And so we're, again, we're seeing this blend. And so I, I think as a profession, it's really easy for us to make things black and white, but the reality is that often these things live in the gray, and it's, it's this mixture of digital and in-person, secular and religious, um, you know, service versus disposition, all of those things together. I think what I like about what you're saying uh, in this is the fact that you know, every funeral director is going to bring what they bring to the table, and there's a place for yeah. a lot of that as long as they're willing to communicate with families and figure out more creative yeah. ways that they can participate. That's awesome. Um, did you did you find anything else? Yeah, so the last thing, um, and again, this just goes back to a narrative that's been told for um, as long as I can remember, which is really this idea, and it's held true for a long time that younger generations don't see the value in funerals and funeral homes. And so that it's that tends to be an older generation, that tends to be, uh, and some of that makes sense that an older generation has experienced loss and grief and has interacted more with funeral homes. But one of the surprising things that we're finding is there is a younger segment, a younger group of consumers that does see the value in funeral homes and funeral service. Um, and they very much have this mindset of funerals are here to help us grieve are here to help us deal with loss. Uh, and we hadn't seen that in the past. Um, and so, again, that, that kind of ties back to the very first point of there's room for optimism, r- room for hope within the profession, uh, which I think has been counter to the narrative that's been told for at least 10, if not 20 years. What do you think is at stake here for if we don't pay attention to trends like this? I, I think so good funeral I, homes... I think- are going to adapt and they are going going to serve these people well. Um, And I don't think they're, you know, the the term disruption and all of that has come in and who knows, maybe, you know, you don't have quote unquote funeral homes, you have celebration of life centers, you have whatever, but the the core function ends up being the same. So I I don't think that there is necessarily a imminent risk to the profession as a whole, but I do think that there's risk to individual funeral homes and individual funeral directors, and that there, and that risk is that if you ignore this, just like in any business, if you ignore your customers and you ignore who you're serving, they're going to stop using you. They're going to stop paying you, um, and they're going to go to find someone else. And so I think, you know, the, the um, probably overused Wayne Gretzky quote is to skate to where the puck is going, not to where it is. And it's that by ignoring this, you are staying where you are, not to where the puck's going. And so staying in front of this allows you to better serve families. And I, the one thing I'll say is that I have never met a funeral director that wasn't in this profession to serve families and someone that didn't want to better serve those families. Well, Josh, uh, I think I want to have you back. Uh, and talk a little bit more maybe next time about uh, some more of the, the findings that you've had. Um, in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about uh, how available is this information to the average funeral director? Yeah, so we, we summarized this whole report uh, and we have it available as a download. 
And so you can go to either Pissari's website or Funeral Director's Life's website. Uh, I think we can also put it in the show notes, the description underneath this, um, link it within there. Um, but yeah, we want to make this as readily available because we do want people um, being able to adapt and better serve their families. Uh, the other thing that I would add to this is one of the unique offerings we're able to provide in conjunction with McKee Wall Work is, um, you know, we give a national generalization of here's who the consumers are throughout the U.S. Um, but one of the cool things that we're able to do is we're able to take that data and um, extrapolate it and pair it with localized data. And so if there's any interest in wanting to see in my specific zip code, um, that's the, le the, the level we can get down to, um, who are the people that I'm serving, we actually have the ability to do that. Now there's a cost and there's a fee associated with that, but you're able to get some real insight. And people ask me all the time, well, what can I do with that data? It's, the better question is what can you not do with that data? It's, it should inform your, your business strategy, your sales efforts, your marketing strategy, your uh, operations that we see um, all the time funeral homes trying to be all things to all people. Um, and the paradox of business and of marketing is that whenever you, uh, whenever you um, break it down and you say, I'm going to serve this specific type of people, you end up uh, broadening your appeal. And so this gives you that information and says, here are the people in my community and uh, the ways that I can best serve them. That's fantastic. Josh, thanks for being here today. Uh, thanks for watching and listening. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, or if you have some thoughts on future episodes, you can always email me at fdtalks at funeraldirectorslife.com. Thanks and have a great day. If you would like to reach out to us about this episode or this series, please visit us online at funeraldirectorslife.com forward slash FD Talks. There you can find information about this episode and submit any comments, suggestions, or feedback about our series. And we also welcome your ideas for future episodes. Join us next time on FD Talks as we explore ideas, insights, and solutions for serving families in a rapidly changing marketplace.